Well, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Philippe Bouchard and the organizing committee to have scheduled this, the presentation of these guidelines. As you know, in the past years, the menopause field has changed a lot following the publication from Women Health Initiative, and we felt that clinicians and women would need new guidelines to know a bit more about how to treat their symptoms. So it, these guidelines have been edited on the support and behalf of the Endocrine Society. The text, which will be published soon in the GCM, has been endorsed by the European Society of Endocrinology, the International Menopause Society, the NAMS, the European Menopause Society, the Australasian Menopause Society. So I have the charge today to present that to you as a member of this society. My conflict of interest are mostly to be past or actual board member of um, menopause and uh, societies, and I have also received some research grant from Achera, Utero, and Ponterai Bioscience, but nothing to do with that, these gu guidelines. So the Endocrine Society appointed a task force initiated, directed by Richard Senten, which was the pre we, who was the president at that time, and rapidly take, took over, taken over by Cynthia Stunkel. And it was also, she, was, uh, she worked with four other women, Susan Davis from Australia, myself from uh, Paris, uh, France, Marianne Lumsden from UK, and John Pickenton from uh, USA. I can tell you that it took a long time for these five women to reach a consensus. And so I hope that the text and the main guidelines I will present will fit also your advice and opinion. So of course, we look at the best available research evidence uh, for the, to develop this recommendation and using the grade system. And also the task force commissioned the conduct of three meta-analyses to inform its key recommendation. These three meta-analyses uh, were the following. The first one aimed to compare the effect of oral versus transdermal estrogen on the risk of venous and arterial thrombotic events. The second one to evaluate the effect of menopausal hormone therapy on mortality. And the third one to compare the effect of MHT with natural progesterone versus synthetic progestins on breast cancer risk. The goals of these guidelines were in first to focus on treatment of symptoms of menopause, but also emphasizing individualized clinical approach according to patient symptoms, personal, their personal preferences, and their overall health status and also suggest baseline risk assessment, which can lead to contraindication to medical therapies, essentially cardiovascular risk and breast cancer risk. These guidelines do not deal with the treatment of premature ovarian uh, failure or insufficiency. These guidelines also were as, uh, aimed to review the treatment options for symptom relief, whether hormonal, non-hormonal, or OTCs, established fundamental recommendations which acknowledging global differences in population practice and prescriptive therapies. As I said, we came from different fields, different world, different uh, cul medical culture, and this is something I can tell you. So the approach to these menopause guidelines, there are five different parts. The first one is diagnostic diagnosis, and these menopause guidelines concern only postmenopausal women below the age of 60 and uh, less than 10 years since menopause. So the diagnosis we recommend it's based on to be based on the clinical criteria of the menstrual cycle, and of course, presence of climacteric symptoms. In few women, when indicated in rare cases, 
a sample of SSH and estradiol could be proposed and need to be replicated. We also recommend to take into account health consideration for all women, whether you will treat them or not. And then, if these women have complaint of vasomotor symptoms, moderate or severe, if they are interested in taking hormones and don't present contraindications, then maybe MHT will be prescribed. I will develop that approach. So in women below the age of 60 and or 10 years since menopause, interested in menopause hormonal tre treatment, we could consider MHT. If she's over 60 or over 10 years since menopause, maybe additional options could be considered and proposed. The first important contraindication should, could be a cardiovascular risk. So we propose to evaluate the cardiovascular risk. In women with high risk, definitely consider additional option to MHT. In the other case, it should be acceptable. Same thing for breast cancer risk. It's important to evaluate it. And in women with high to moderate risk, including, I will go back to that in a few slides, including women who could be uh, proposed with uh, preventive uh, chemotherapy, such as SERMs or um, uh, aromatase inhibitors, then in most of the case, consider additional option to MHT. In other case, might be acceptable. The main point which was discussed during weeks and weeks and males and males is how to evaluate these risks. And can, I can tell you in one word, there is no definitive recommendation of that because no clinical trial evidence is available to support the practice of incorporating risk assessment instrument for quantifying cardiovascular risk and breast cancer risk. The American, uh, the USA expert, favorite a lot the use of scores but we discuss on that, that they have low specificity. And we conclude, uh, and we agreed on the, this following statement, that they can be helpful to initiate a discussion about risk, but in general, risks are overestimated for cardiovascular risk, or not well as assessed, for score for breast cancer risk because of moderate discriminatory accuracy. So we suggest to evaluate individual classic risk, known as increasing cardiovascular events in breast cancer, family history, smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, med syndrome, obesity, thrombophilia, reproductive factors, and so on. Concerning the cardiovascular risk, we state, we recommend that if the risk is intermediate, prefer transdermal estradiol and micronized progesterone or close progestins. For venous thrombotic risk, maybe to consider the history of the event in a past history, if a past history has occurred in these women, that is to say, the thrombosis occurred according to an estrogen environment, pregnancy, oral contraception, or not, by example, fracture. In women with thrombophilia, biological thrombophilia without a history of uh, venous thrombosis, we discussed a lot and say that this could constitute a contraindication definitely to oral estradiol, but not necessarily to transdermal estradiol at minimal dose associated combined with micronized progesterone or closed progestogen. Concerning the metabolic syndrome, we said that the evidence at this time is inadequate to make firm recommendations. Transdermal estradiol and micronized progesterone or closed progesterone again would be anticipated to have less deleterious metabolic effects than oral therapies, 
but there is no definitely randomized control study to confirm that statement. It's a suggestion, not a recommendation. Confirming concerning diabetes, we said that a stringent appraisal of the cardiovascular status is necessary, and in some cases, when the benefits overcome the, the risk, if the woman is extremely symptomatic, again, transdermal estradiol combined with progesterone could be discussed. Concerning the breast cancer risk, we said that it was prudent not to recommend MHG for women with criteria for breast cancer prevention with CERMs or aromatase inhibitors. These criteria are based on risk calculators such as the National Cancer Institute Breast Cancer Risk Assessment Tool, and with different uh, evaluation of the risk for the Task Force for Preventive uh, Treatment from the US. They said that they proposed that women with a five years risk of above three percent should be considered for chemopreventive therapy, whereas for the ASCO, this risk is begin start at 1.7%. So you see different appraisal, different evaluation. There are several risk calculators you can use from the internet. You can download freely. And the two main which combine genetic and clinical factors are the first one I spoke, I told you about here, which is downloaded, can be downloaded at this address, and also the IBIS. Unfortunately, both have low accuracy, as I told you, and predict only about 60 to 65 percent of the risk. But there is another fact, risk factors I have not mentioned so far, which, so far, which is in our opinion, opinion of the expert of the group, very important to appraise, to evaluate the risk of breast cancer, which is high breast density. None of these um, uh, scores included high breast risk density. So the approach to patient with VMS considering HT is if the if uterus the uterus if the woman is hysterectomized estrogen alone in presence of uterus it is necessary to combine the estrogen to a progestogen. We also addressed during this statement the possibility of using estrogen combined with basidoxyphen or tibolon, but not as first line. So the hormone therapy for postmenopausal women will be indicated in case of bothersome vasomotor symptoms, even found possibly associated with other climacteric symptoms in women below the age of 60 and 10 years since menopause, without contraindication, without excess cardiovascular or breast cancer risk, who are willing to take MHT, and estrogen only for those without uterus, and combine with progestin with those with a uterus. There are some controversies. Are some MHT preparation dose and route of administration safer than others? What duration of MHT is safe? What are effects of MHT on prevention and mortality? So we try to answer to this question. That's why we commissioned this meta-analysis concerning comparison between transdermal therapy and oral uh, estrogen, and also the breast cancer risk. So this is the conclusion of the first meta-analysis, which address again the question of oral versus transdermal estradiol on the risk of venous and arterial thrombotic events. And their conclusion is that from 14 observational studies, of course, no randomized control studies, this suggests that compared to transdermal MHG, oral MHG may be associated with increased risk of VTE, DVT, sorry, and 
possibly stroke, but not myocardial infarction. Concerning the comparison between natural progesterone and synthetic progestins, their conclusion were, was that from two observational studies, natural progesterone may be associated with a reduced risk for breast cancer compared to synthetic progestins. Another question is how to stop. So we suggest that the decision to continue MHT be revisited at least annually, targeting the shortest total duration of MHT, consistent with the treatment goals and evolving risk assessment of the individual women. And for women preparing to discontinue MHT, we suggest a shared decision-making approach to elicit individual preference about adopting a gradual taper versus abrupt, abrupt discontinuation, no clear data, no really robust data to say it's better to, to use gradual taper, but it was the expert advice. So in case now in climacteric symptoms, but where patient declines MHT or having contraindication, we suggest to use or recommend to use non-hormonal therapies. So, first of all, and for all women concerned with menopause symptoms, we suggested a series of steps that do not involve medication, turning down the thermostat, dressing in layers, in layers avoiding alcohol, excitement, spicy foods, and reduce obesity and stress. <laughs> that can help. For moderate to severe, so please do be kind with your postmenopausal uh, partner. For moderate to severe VMS we, VMS, we recommend SSRI, SNRI, gabapentin, or pregabalin. As a second line after failure of this product or drugs, tri a trial of clonidine could be uh, proposed. There is lack of consistent evidence for benefit for botanicals, black hose, red clover, vitamin E, mind-body alternatives, including anxiety control, acupuncture, etc. But they can help in individual setting. So now the treatment of genital urinary syndrome of menopause, it's important because most of the clinicians forget to speak that, to address this question with their patient. So we suggest a trial of vaginal moisturization moisturizers at least twice weekly and vaginal lubricants and in men without history of estrogen dependent cancer with vulvovaginal atrophy that persists despite the use of the previous uh, substance. We recommend low dose vaginal estrogen therapy. In women with a history of hormone dependent cancer, we suggest a shared decision-making approach that includes the treating ecologist to discuss using low-dose vaginal estrogen. I think this, what I will read now and present is very important. An additional caveat. As the impact of severe menopausal symptoms on quality of life may be substantial, there are instances in which a woman with a history of coronary heart disease, of breast cancer, for example, let's say usual classical contraindication to MHT, according to what I said previously, will choose to accept a degree of risk that might be considered to outweigh the benefits of MHT. An accepted philosophy that a fully informed patient should be empowered to make a decision that best balances benefits to that individual when weight against potential risks. So our conclusions were that menopause hormone therapy is the most efficient, effective treatment for vasomotor symptoms and other symptoms of the climacteric. Benefits may exceed risk for the majority of symptomatic, symptomatic post-menopausal women below the age of 60 or less than 10 years since onset of menopause. Therapy should be individualized based on clinical factors and patient preference. Prior to initiating MHT, women should be screened for cardiovascular and breast cancer risk. 
and the most appropriate therapy should be recommended depending, depend, depending on risk-benefit consideration. Current evidence does not justify use of MHT to prevent coronary heart disease, breast cancer, or dementia. Additional options are available to those, for those with vasomotor symptoms, but with preference not to use MHC or with contraindication. Low-dose vaginal estrogen and ospemifen, I didn't speak about because I had no time to speak about all the, to present all the recommendations or suggestions. But in some countries, it's a, it is approved, like the US, provide effective therapy for the genitourinary symptoms. And also, importantly, all postmenopausal women should embrace appropriate lifestyle measure. So thank you for, this, for your attention. I acknowledge all my colleagues who, who are now my friends because we spend a lot of time discussing with some pleasant time. Thank you very much. <clears throat>